Mark, a real pleasure to have you on the show. This is uh, your first time talking to me and, and vice versa. And Energy Fuels, a long-standing uranium uh, producer. Why did Energy Fuels diversify into critical minerals in that product line? Well, first of all, Pat, it's nice to meet you. Um, and uh, yeah, we've got a unique story over other companies. And, and the main reason we decided to diversify is because a number of the critical elements that people are focused on on the energy transition uh, contain uranium and other radionuclides that nobody else could really monetize, and we could. So, I mean, if you look, Pat, at, um, you know, the, 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 you know, when people are focused on just one single element, look at what's happened to lithium, graphite, cobalt, uh, rare earth, uranium, um, any element, um, you're you're really open uh, to a certain amount of risk on the, the 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 commodity prices of that element. And so, what we're doing is we're building a critical mineral hub that nobody's done before, uh, particularly in North America, where we're focused on recovering about ten critical elements of the fifty that are on the critical mineral list. But they all have that common denominator: they contain uranium. Uh, and other radionuclides, all at low levels, that we have the ability to recover the uranium and deal with those residuals when others do not. Okay, talk to me about that whole process, because you have the only conventional uranium mill in uh, White Mesa uh, mill. Uh, how did you repurpose it, or did you repurpose it uh, to deal with these critical minerals? Yeah, the, the, the White Mesa mill uh, was built as a uranium vanadium processing facility. And uh, over the years, we've been able to take a number of what we call alternate feeds, which are other natural uranium products that could also we could recover the uranium on. Um, and then when we started looking at uh, the rare earths, monazite in particular, that contains uh, material quantities of uranium, um, we, we, we had the, the infrastructure, the know-how, and the licenses to recover the uranium from the monocyte. So it, it's really a bolt-on. Um, monocyte and these rare earths become a, um, a bolt-on byproduct of what we've been doing for 40 years at that facility. So what we've done is um, we've retrofitted the facility to recover, and it still can recover uranium and vanadium, but also to be recovering these uh, rare earth elements um, required for this energy transition. As it currently stands, do you have enough feedstock, not only for uranium, but the other minerals as well? Well, we're building that story on the feedstock. We, 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 we're, we're building up our supplies of uranium ores right now. We're shipping to the mill. We've got large stockpiles at the mills. Um, when it comes to um, the monazite, uh, we have an existing relationship uh, with um, Kimors, who's been supplying the monazite to us from Florida and Georgia. Uh, we've also secured a project in Brazil called Bahia that we're currently doing exploration drilling on. And we've also uh, signed a binding joint venture for developing a permitted project in Australia. And we've got a um, currently a, a takeover combination um, uh, initiative with a company called Base Resources, also based in Australia at a project in Madagascar. So, so we're building our story of feed for monazite as we speak so that we have material quantities. And by material, I'm talking about Linus quantities, very large quantities, uh, looking out three, four years. And in the meantime, as we finish up our processing of um, the monazite we're currently processing at the mill, uh, we'll switch the mill back to uranium production. I know for uranium, you currently use what is called a buying schedule, which is effectively buying the feedstock and taking the risk on the underlying mineral. How do you do that with uh, critical, critical minerals? Well, we we don't currently have a buying schedule in place. I mean, we're getting our feed from our, our existing mines that we own uh, and alternate feed, which we secure from companies like Cameco and, and Honeywell, Converdine, um, and, and, and we secure that on our own. Um, the uranium, uh, we are talking to people about a buying schedule where we basically buy it on like a percentage of value 
uh, contained value going forward. And on the rare earths currently with Kimors, uh, we also are procuring um, the material from Kimors effectively on a on a on a on a price um, related um, mechanism to secure it from them. But going forward, in places like Bahia, um, and it, it, it's different on these different different deals that we have. Uh, we'll secure our own sources of monazite where we're not really procuring it. We're getting it as a byproduct from the heavy mineral sands um, sector. Energy Fuels is famous for, or not known for its profitability, if you will. You focus on being profitable. Uh, can you do that with critical minerals when you're first getting started? Or would you look for something like government aid? Well, we're building our story around um, no government aid. Um, I think people that, that assume that they have to have government aid to be successful uh, could be a very slippery slope. Um, yeah, we have been profitable um, over the last um, number of quarters. Um, and uh, last year we had uh, over, well, approximately 100 millions of net income. And the first quarter, Q1, uh, we were also profitable. So, yeah, we're focused on profitability in the uranium space. Um, when we look at the rare earth space uh, we're looking at securing um, uh, feed sources and being able to process that white mesa that does not require government support uh, perhaps some non-recourse uh, loans of some sort but not actually subsidies so um, yeah we're, we're building and we're a company that's focused on the long game we're not focused on the short game we're focused on um, uh, building a long-term, profitable, sustainable, diversified with these critical elements that I mentioned, 10 of a list of 50, and not being uh, dependent on any one element going forward. And we believe, if you believe, and if investors believe in the energy transition, uh, where would be a better place to be when it comes to a company that has several critical elements that they're focused on and has a long history of recovering many of these critical elements already. Yeah, I want to come back to that shareholder perspective. Before we do, though, uh, talk to me about mergers and acquisition because you've touched on some of them. Bahia would be uh, an example of that. The Donald Project in uh, Australia, um, uh, Bear Resources in Madagascar. Uh, how do you anticipate your M&A strategy going forward? Well, it's been pretty active recently. Um, we, we hold 100% uh, of the Bahia project in Brazil, 100% owned um, the, um, the Donald project with Astron in Australia uh, is a joint venture where we'd be earning our 49% but getting 100% of the monazite from that project um, if, if it gets into production, which we think it will. Uh, and then base resources, uh, the, the combination of base resources um, we're, it's work in progress. Uh, we're implementing a scheme of arrangement with base resources, and then we'd actually uh, own um, base resources and their assets in both Kenya and Madagascar. Um, so so it's, it, they're, they're, they're all a little bit different uh, in how they've basically um, transpired, but the focus being on low cost, not requiring government subsidies, um, and material scale. Okay, so now you've made the argument for diversification and uh, being uh, profitable as a priority for you. How do you continue to enhance the value of the company for your shareholders? Well, simple. We show our shareholders that we're building a long-term world material critical mineral hub that is profitable, that does these multi-elements at low cost, and that we're doing it in a creative way that um, really hasn't been done before in the fact that there has never really been a uranium company and a heavy mineral sand company you know, combined into getting the best result. Now, the closest uh, example is the Chinese. The Chinese, uh, CNNC is one of the big uh, uranium uh, companies and nuclear power companies in China. They also process monazite uh, to secure the uranium in the rare earths uh, from that monazite. So, so we're really replicating um, the China story, which, which is, you know, 80% of the rare earths in, 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 in the world, uh, we're replicating as energy fuels. And we believe that it is such an exciting area 
that there is no real playbook out there. We're, we're, we're creating this playbook as we go. Yeah, except the benefit is you're made in America, right? Correct, and made in America. And, um, and, and, and that is a, uh, a very significant point, uh, Pat, because there are, uh, you know, people are needing to see this reshoring happening in the United States of America, and somebody has to do it. I mean, it doesn't going to happen if somebody doesn't try to do it. And you've got, you got MP in California uh, advancing their plans. You've got Energy Fuels, a proven uranium producer with um, decades of experience in that uh, in the uranium sector. And then you have our company that's also bolting on uh, these monocyte sources for our uh, rare earth play. And we're producing uh, separated NDPR right now at the White Mesa Mill. And, and, and a lot of people talk about things, but they don't actually do things. And we're a company of doers. And we have a, a long history of, of being doers, and I have a long history of being a doer globally um, at projects around the world. Mark, we look forward to your continued success. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, Pat. Nice to meet you.